thank you. Um, we've been focusing on the cross for the last four Sundays. And uh, one of the, my favorite scripture verses, and I, I say it a lot, uh, I, I say John three sixteen a lot, and I say Romans chapter 5, verse 8 a lot. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, <laughs> you don't have to go there, brother, but it says, uh, the love of God has been demonstrated in this, Christ died on the cross for sinners. It shows the demonstration of God's love. It reveals God's grace. How? That Jesus Christ came to die for us who are sinners. And it's an amazing thing that God has done. Uh, And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if you go to verse 14, we're going to start there and then move back to verse 11. But look at this verse. The love of Christ compels us. You know what that word means? The love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. You got to go back to uh, God demonstrated his love towards us and that while we were yet a sinner, Christ died for us. What he's saying is Jesus Christ died for every sinner. He died for every type of sinner. He died for a black sinner. He died for a white sinner. He died for a rich sinner. He died for a poor sinner. He died for a dirty, rotten, stinking sinner. And he died for a nice church pew-sitting sinner. Uh, He died for all. He died for you. He died for me. You can't go uh, so far away from uh, God that you can't say, well, he didn't die for me. He died for all. He died no matter where you are. And so, uh, and, and, and what Paul is saying is uh, the love of Christ. Now look, it doesn't say our love for Christ, does it? It says his love for us. And that's a, it's a very clear distinction here. Uh, because it's, he is saying the love that Jesus Christ has displayed for us on the cross. Go back to verse 14, please. Uh, on the cross compels us, drives us, seizes us is actually what that word means. In other verses, it means that, that, that one person grabs another person and, and, and cap, captures him, seizes him. You know, and, and we've heard the phrase uh, carpe diem, right? Uh, seize the day. Well, it's not that we're to seize the day. We're to allow Jesus to seize us. And, and not just Jesus, the love that Jesus displays. And, and as I was listen, looking at this scripture verse, uh, th- that idea of, of being seized reminded me of something that I had to deal with almost daily when I was a child. My, my father was born in 1922, and he uh, was called a forceps baby. Anybody know what a forceps baby is? They grabbed the head. And he had brain damage. He actually went to Johns Hopkins to have brain surgery uh, in 1923. Uh, And and so he had seizures. He was an epileptic. And any of you who have lived with epilepsy know that it's a scary thing to live with. And at that time, because this was the 60s and the 70s, it wasn't well managed. They only had phenobarbital. And so what would happen almost daily, my dad would have some form of seizure. And his were not the grand mal seizures. His were the, they called them petite seizures, which means that he would just kind of check out on you. But when, when he would have a seizure, uh, the electrical impulses and his brain would just scramble and take over his body, take over his senses, and take over every part of what he was doing. 
uh, and, and he would, for instance, when we were one day at a uh, buffet, he had a seizure and he just kept on piling uh, potatoes on his plate. It was overflowing and he kept on piling. And, and, you know, as listen, I was four years old and I needed to know how to drive. Because my dad possibly would have a seizure. And, and he drove, I don't, I'm telling you, it was, it was interesting to live with my father. I love my dad, but, but, um, but it was very interesting uh, because he would have a seizure and I would have to grab the wheel and, he, he, and pull over. He would, you know, maybe have to use the brakes because the seizure would take over his whole senses and his ability to control. And what Paul is saying here is that God's love, the love of Christ, has seized me. I am having a seizure, and this seizure has taken over and how I think, how I behave. It's taken over how I do my life. I'm overwhelmed. I am captured. I am captivated by the love of Christ. It's, a, it's an amazing picture. Uh, it, it's a wonderful picture of what, what happens when you're captured by what Jesus did on Calvary's cross. He died for our sins. He laid his life down because we were in need of salvation. Now, I want to lay out just a few things uh, of what happens when we're seized by this love and the first thing when we're seized by this love we become captivated uh, by a new perspective you got to move on up to see the new perspective um, we'll start with um, verse 9 we'll just move up a little bit more to verse 9 in second corinthians therefore we make it our aim whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. So the whole focus is, I want to please God. I, I want to reveal and make known and, and love God and please him with my life. And, and, and this is so, so critical. If your heartbeat as a person is not to put God first and to please him, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will come unto you. If that's not your heartbeat, the Bible says you've got a heart problem. And that heart problem can cause a lot of trouble. Uh, you think you might be okay, but verse uh, 10 says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This is going to happen. Jesus is, he came as the Lamb of God, which, take, which takes away the sins of the world the first time, but he's coming as the Lion of Judah, and he is, God has given him permission to judge all things and all people, and he is going to stand on the judgment seat of Christ. We all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And here's, here, I'm a people pleaser, and, and this verse means so much to me. Uh, who are we to please in verse 9? We're to please him. Okay, why verse 10? Because we're going to stand before one judge. Uh, you know, I, I, Bertha, I love you, uh, but, but you're not going to be on the throne. She's my mother-in-law, and boy, I want to please her, uh, and I want to please George too, but, you know, and, I, and, I, and, and, and God forbid me uh, bring displeasure to Kathy Callison. Oh, my goodness, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, you know what I'm saying? I love, I want to please you, but, but you're not going to be on the throne, are you? And, and sometimes we get so wrapped up about pleasing people and, and, and setting, uh, having specific appearances and, and making sure that we look good, and, and that, that we get lost in our life. We lose our aim. We lose our focus. And Paul is saying, hey, don't lose your focus. Please, God, you've got to have this perspective above all things. You've got to be captivated by this perspective. Jesus is going to judge you and no one else. But you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 
that each one of you may receive what is done in your body. So what he's saying is what you do today matters. We should wake up every morning and say, Father, I want to give you pleasure. Jesus, I want to please you with what I do, the decisions I make, how I live my life, what I do with my hands, what I do with my eyes, what I do with my mouth. I want my heartbeat to bring praise and glory to you, Jesus, and bring the greatest pleasure to you. So why? We're going to stand before his throne and we may receive what is good in our body, whether, uh, you know, uh, wh- uh, uh, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So verse 11, he says this. This is interesting. Knowing, therefore, what does it say? The terror of who? The terror of the Lord. Have you ever known the terror of God? That this, this word, it doesn't mean uh, reverence. This is not the word, oh, it means like you're revering him. No, it means that you are scared to death. Have you ever been scared to death of God? I, I, if any of you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, the answer is Yes. I realize that if I were to die, I would stand before Jesus Christ as my judge, and I would be found wanting. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 20. And Danny knows, Danny I know too, that's the Bema seat. This is the white throne judgment. Uh, Keith, you know that too. <laughs> I'm not confusing them, but the point is... And I think this is the point of the Bible. We're going to stand before Jesus. He's going to be our judge. And, uh, and this is what uh, the book of Revelation says. Then I saw a great, verse 11, verse 11 if you got it. Uh, I'll let you get it if you can. You got it? All right. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it. Who's the him? Jesus is the hymn. Jesus is sitting on this throne. This is another judgment, but it's a judgment nonetheless. It's a judgment of the lost. The Bema seat's a judgment of the saved. But he says this. Um, I saw him who sat on it, and, and uh, from, without, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And then I saw the dead, the small and the great, standing before God, and the books were open, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works uh, by the things which were written in, the, in these books. You know what he's saying? They did not have the blood of Jesus Christ. And so they were judged by their works. Could you imagine standing before God and, and, and without the blood of Jesus Christ? See, the, Jesus is who divides us between heaven and hell. And if you don't have Jesus Christ, he's the provision for our salvation. Man, I, I mean, I told you two weeks ago, I was standing here and there was a guy that was saying, well, do, God, doesn't God love us? And won't everyone go to heaven? No, it's not, because the provision is Jesus Christ. The provision is, is, is a gift, and the gift has to be received. And if we do not receive Jesus Christ as our provision, then we're standing before God, and our sins are not covered and cleansed, and we have no hope. I mean, think of it this way. Heaven's a perfect place. Are you perfect? All right, so you're a sinner. And you're going to stand before a holy God. And God hates sin. That's one of the perspectives that brings terror. God hates sin. And we are so intertwined with sin, it should freak you out. You should be overwhelmed by your sin. Uh, and and not, not stuck in it. Why? Because your focus isn't on who you are. The focus is on who Jesus is. And you're not going to stand in judgment based upon your works. 
It's not by works of righteousness which you have done, but it's by his mercy by which we are saved. So it's not your works, it's what he did. You have to call on the name of the Lord in order to have that salvation. And so he goes on to say, um, verse, am I, I'm in verse 12, yeah. Uh, verse 13, he says, The sea gave up the dead, and those who were, uh, those who were in it, the death, death and Hades, were delivered up, and the dead were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to his works. Then Hades, and, and death and Hades, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Look at verse 15. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And this is the second death. So, if you're not born uh, twice, you're going to die once, but if you're born once, you're going to die twice. What do I mean by that? If you're born twice, your body will die, but your soul will be saved. But if you're only born once, not born spiritually, not born of God, then you're going to die twice. This is the second death. Uh, I want to go back to uh, Revelation chapter 5 one second and show you this scripture verse. You were in Revelation chapter 5 last week, weren't you? Um, Dan, I'm talking to Danny. Revelation chapter 5. Um, just want to touch, touch base with the new song. Uh, th- th- this is what the situation is. And, and, and you'll, you'll see where, I, where I'm going with this. The scrolls of history are, and the scroll of God's plan and God's promises and God's judgment are laid before everyone and, and the, uh, laid before John the Revelator. And he's like, who is worthy to open up these scrolls? Who is worthy uh, to take these scrolls? And this is what uh, the, 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 those who are in heaven said. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and you have, been rede- you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe, tongue, and people, and nation. And you have made us, verse 10 says, made us kings and priests to God, and, and uh, we shall reign on the earth. Listen, this is very carefully and clearly what he's saying. Who is worthy? Jesus. He is the Lamb of God. He is the one who died and is worthy. He rose again and he's ascended to the right hand of God. And you know what? This is where you are. You have to make this decision. You have to make this choice. Is Jesus worthy of all the plans, all your hopes, all your dreams? Would you be willing to lay the scroll of your life to him? And could you say with them, you are worthy, Jesus? To take my life, to take my hopes, to take my dreams. You are worthy to live my entire life to please and serve and to honor and to glorify. You are worthy. And here's our problem. Sometimes you give him your plans. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you give him your scrolls. And sometimes you think, no, you know, you're not worthy to take this. I have to worry about it. I have to fret about it. Because I'm not sure if you're strong enough, you're powerful enough, you're good enough to take this for me. So I will keep it and I will fuss and fret and worry and I will try to uh, gain uh, the the positions and the power. And and Lord, you're not good enough, so I have to be good to myself and I have to uh, uh, have these pleasures in my life that are outside of you because you're not going to take care of me. You know what God is saying here? You lay it down. Sing a new song. Because at the end of the days, he is going to be the one that is the ruler and reigner of all things and he will be the judge of your life. And he is worthy. So why should we fear God? Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verse 11. 
um, Paul says knowing the fear. I mean, this this idea of knowing the fear is like it, it, it's it, it just comes. I, I am uh, overwhelmed. I had this incredibly new perspective because I see who you are, God, and I see who I am, and I don't measure up. Now, here's the thing I found about fear. Um, What does it mean to fear God? Here's what it means to fear God. Fearing God means you respond to God above all other things and all other fears in your life. Your response to who God is, what he says, what he does, is, has so captivated you, it changes your entire perspectives when you have a problem, when you have a worry, when you're fretting, when, you, when you're dealing with sin in your life, you, you go to Jesus. I mean, it's changed you. Because what, uh, you, 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 the other fears are secondary compared to the incredible fear that God has. Uh, if you go to Luke chapter 12, you'll see what I'm talking about. Paul, uh, Jesus very clearly, clearly says, listen, you need to fear God above all. Chapter uh, 12, verse 4 says, And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has the power to cast into hell. I say, fear him. Now, what does he say in verse 14? What compels him? Is it the fear of God? What compels him? The love of God drives him. The love of God has seized him. But you know, you have to start with realizing who you are in the sight of God and that we all have sinned and we've all fallen short. And so he, is, he, is, he starts there and he says, listen, I know the terror of the Lord and therefore I'm persuading men, verse 11 says. Uh, and, and, and we are well known to God, uh, he says. Can you go back to chapter uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11? He says, I'm well known to God. Do you know what this word well known means? It's, it's you're revealed. I mean, you, you, you're, he sees everything. He, he sees it all. Remember when uh, uh, in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, what did they want to do? They hid. They were, they were naked and they had shame. And, and because they didn't want God to say, well, this verse is saying, well, he sees it. He sees what you think. He sees what you do. He, everything's going to be broadcast uh, at the end of the days before the judgment seat of God. I mean, uh, you know, does God forgive our sin? Yes, he does. But we're going to stand before judgment. And what we do matters. And so Paul is saying, I am overwhelmed by the terror of the Lord. And I don't, it's, it's basically Paul saying, hey, the house is on fire. Get out of there. Because God sees all. You can't get away with this. What makes you think that God doesn't see your sin? And, 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 and you're not going to stand before the holy presence of an almighty God. What makes you think that? And so he is saying, he, he, he is saying, listen, you got to start at this point. You got to be convinced and convicted of your sin. You have to. Or you're going to be, there's, there's two things that happen uh, when we deal with this idea of sin. One is we think, hey, I'm better than other people. God grades on a curve and, you know, I'm, I'm better than most. You know, I'm one of the good ones. And, and, and so we get prideful when that happens. That's where the Pharisees were. They were prideful of their performance and their appearances. And, and, and listen, if you don't understand the gospel, it's easy to sit in church and get prideful. The other thing that can happen is you can become so overwhelmed by your sin that you become... You, you go to a place of despair. Uh, in other words, it goes like this. 
um, I'm good enough. And the second sin is God's not good enough. And that leads to despair. Since God's not good enough and I'm in all this trouble, I'm in sin, I'm going to move into a place of condemnation and because he's not going to take care of me, I'm going to take care of myself and I'm going to move into the sins of the flesh. It happens all the time. And so that's where you're in one of those two places if you're in sin. And so he is saying here that um, this, this love has compelled him and, and, and we, it's well known to God. And he says, I hope it's well known to you. Verse 12, he goes on to say, and we do not commend ourselves to you again, but give you an opportunity to boast on our behalf. And what he's saying here, he's not saying boast upon our appearances or boast upon uh, 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 our performance. No, he, he makes it clear what he's to boast in. He goes on to say in verse 12, that you may answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. So here's the new perspective. The new perspective is this. You're a sinner. God hates sin. And you can try to dress up a pig. You can try to put a, a lipstick on a pig, but a pig's still a what? Pig. Listen, you, gotta, you, you need a heart change. There, there needs to happen something within. You, know, you can dress up and go to church. You can smell good. You can do all the do's and not do the don'ts. You can have all the appearances and, and try to um, save yourself, but you, it's not going to be good enough. I'm not boasting in that, Paul says. I am boasting in what God has done in my heart that Jesus has saved me and redeemed me and set me free and that I, he has delivered me from, uh, from, from false religion, from powerless uh, activity. Now I am captor, captured and captivated by the love of Christ. And he goes on in verse 13 to say, uh, if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, if you think I'm a fool, if you think I'm crazy, if you think I'm nuts, Nikki, this one's for you. Uh, <laughs> if you think I'm nuts, it's not because I, I'm nuts for myself. I am crazy about Jesus Christ. It's what he's saying. It's incredible. He's saying, I have been so seized and captivated and captured and overwhelmed by this new perspective that I am crazy for Jesus. If we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are of sound mind, it is for you. In other words, I'll become all things to all men that may win some of Christ. You know, he's, he's focusing on giving glory to God and being good for others. And then we move on to verse 14. And we've already touched base with this. But, but verse 14 uh, says, for, we, for the love of God compels us. Because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. Verse 15, and if all have died, if, if he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So he's, he's, he's saying, I am captured and captivated by a new motivation. This, this new perspective has given me a new motivation. What's my motivation? Verse 15 says, I'm not living for myself. I'm living for the one who died and rose again. Now, now I'm going to say this. I said it Wednesday, and some people were looking at me like, are you crazy, Pastor John? But this is so true. This, our churches in America have been teaching a half gospel. Do you know what the half gospel is? All right, and when I share it, you're going to, you're going to think, well, well, wait a minute, isn't that the whole gospel? No, no, it's just the half gospel. What's the half gospel? Jesus was sent by God, fully human, fully divine. Uh, he lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for our sins so that we could have forgiveness from our sins and peace with God. Wait a minute. That's what I've heard all my life. Isn't that the gospel? No. It's only half the gospel. That gospel says this salvation is so that you can be benefited. 
But the full gospel is this. And you see it in this verse. The full gospel is Jesus was fully human, fully divine, came by, his, by, by the Father. He died on the cross. He rose again on the third day so that if we call on his name, we have forgiveness of sin and peace with God and we can live for his good and for his glory forever. What's the difference? The second reveals the purpose of our salvation. Our salvation isn't for you and me. Our salvation is for Jesus. Our salvation is so that God can put us on display and reveal his glory for all to see. Uh, and look at this. This is, this is what he's saying here. He says, um, verse 15, he died for all that those who live should no longer live who? For themselves. We think our salvation is for us. Don't we? And here's the problem. If you think your salvation is for you, guess what you've done? You, you just have a little bit of fire insurance. That's all you've done. You know, you, you've prayed the prayer and you've signed the dotted line and said, okay, now I have fire insurance. I can live however I want and do whatever I want and God still loves me. I'm sorry, you're going to stand before Jesus Christ and you're going to be a goat. If you think you can live, however you so choose to live and make decisions, however you, so, you think you can't hand over the scrolls of your life to Jesus Christ, that's a lie. What does this verse say? Now, now listen, you know, you're, I know I'm saying something maybe you haven't heard. And you're thinking, what, is he telling the truth? You got to look at the word. What does the word say? He says, we should no longer live for themselves. Who should we live for? But for him who died and rose again. We were saved for Jesus. Since he died for me, I'm going to live for you, Jesus. I mean, if you think, well, that's just one verse. What does is, what is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, 9, and 10 say? For we're... For we are saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are what? His workmanship, created for his good, to do good works. See, when you know Jesus Christ, number one, you're going to fear him. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna fear Jesus Christ. And if you've never come to that place where that fear of judgment has come upon you and you're overwhelmed that, that you are a sinner and God is holy and just and you don't measure up, you're not going to respond to the second part of the gospel that Jesus died for you. He died to save you from God's wrath because you were dead in your sins and trespasses. And you won't, you won't understand the love of Christ. You won't get it. You won't be seized by the love of Christ. The love of Christ has captured us. And I am so captivated by what Jesus has done for me that I will live the entire life for him. The problem is... We think we were saved and God, we think God is a blank check and we can write out a check and here's the promise and we can name it and we can claim it. And listen, guess what happens when life gets tough, when life gets hard and God doesn't deliver the way you think he should deliver? What do you do? You give up on God. You know why you give up on God? Because you don't understand the gospel message. You don't understand if the only thing that Jesus Christ did was die on the cross so you could have eternal life and that doesn't deserve his complete loyalty for the rest of your life, you don't understand the gospel. And we all don't understand. Every single one of us don't understand the gospel. I mean, Paul is saying, I am driven. I am compelled. I am overwhelmed. I am captured. I am captivated by the cross of Jesus Christ. I will deny myself 
I will take up my cross and I will follow Jesus Christ. Because what good would it be to gain the whole world and lose my own soul? What good would it be? It would be no good. And what would you gain if you lost your whole soul and you were, to, and you were in hell? What would you give? Everything. God is saying, you give everything now. You give it now. You know, some people think you can have Jesus as Savior and not Lord. I don't know. I don't know. If, if he's your Savior, you're going to let him be Lord. Why? Because you have been captured by God's love. Verse 14 says, for the love of Christ drives us. Now, what does the love of Christ drive us to do? Well, verse 16, he says, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we no longer know him. So he's finishing up this idea of, of a, this new perspective. I've been captivated and captured by this new perspective, this new, this new idea, this new motivation. I don't see people the same. I, I see two kinds of people. Now listen, this is where love begins in your heart. Because don't you deal with stupid people? Don't you? Well, they're stupid for a reason. Did you realize that? I know, stupid is and stupid does. Uh, now, you were once stupid. And sometimes you still act stupid. Because you're still captured and captivated in sin. And even though God says that I love you and I've forgiven you and you're to give that love and forgiveness to others and speak kindly and be tender hearted and be compassionate, you don't do it. Because you're not captive, you're not captured by God's love. You talk and yap and nip at people. You say negative things about them. You shoot words that will hurt them or their reputation, thinking that God won't judge you. God's going to judge you. Jesus said, you know, you've heard it said, you shall not commit murder. But I'm telling you, if you call your brother a fool, you're guilty of hell's fire. So you know what? We got to watch what we say. We got to watch what we do. Because, why? Because, now Paul says it, I am captured and captivated by love. Every, every sin you commit is not necessarily an obedience problem. It's a love problem. You don't love Jesus. You're not revealing him. You're not making him known. And so he goes on to say uh, in verse 16, Therefore, from now on, or verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature, new creation. So there's two types of people. What are they? There's people who know Christ and people who don't know Christ. There are goats and there are sheep. On your, the, the right side is the, normally the... Uh, I but anyway, you, and so you, they're either lost or saved. There, there are 99 sheep. 99 are safe and one is lost what, is, what, is, uh, what does the shepherd do the good shepherd he goes after the lost Jesus said I have come to seek and save them that are lost you know what he's saying I can't help but to love people because they're in a fiery house and they're going to burn and they don't have a hope without Jesus Christ and them rescuing them. And I have Jesus Christ. I have the message of the gospel. I got to share Jesus with others. I have to. I can't help it. Because if I don't, they're going to burn in an everlasting fire. There's, there's two kinds of people. We get so focused in our prejudices and we, we look at people as either stupid or smart or black or white or rich or poor or good or bad uh, or a, a, you know, a criminal or a non-criminal, whatever. We, we look at people, God says, no, 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 no. There's lost or saved. Safe and found or separated and they're going to if they breathe their last breath they're not going to be with me in eternal life and I've come to seek and save them that are lost and so I see just two kinds of people 
safe, secure, or lost and eternally separated. And I want them to know Jesus Christ. If anyone is in Christ, who's anyone? Are you in anyone? Does it matter how much you've sinned? Does it matter how far you've gone? No. If anyone can... Uh, a guard that was in a uh, Holocaust uh, per, uh, concentration camp come to know Christ? Sure he can. It doesn't matter how far you've gone. If anyone is in Christ, in other words, if they call on the name of Jesus Christ and find their salvation in him, now I want you to understand, so often we say, I just asked Jesus into my heart, and I would say that's necessarily wrong, but we think of uh, big me, little Jesus. This is big Jesus, little me, isn't it? We're not, Jesus isn't in me, we're in him. <laughs> and so, so if, if you dwell and live and find your resting place, find your salvation in Christ, guess what? You're a new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. So uh, we are created as a new person. We are captivated by a new perspective. We are created as a new person. The old is gone, the new has come. It's a beautiful picture. This is also one of my favorite scripture verses. Because it's making it very clear that Jesus makes all things new. And that's why he came. He made me new. He wants to make you new. He wants you to deliver you from your sins so you don't have to live in terror but be compelled by God's love. In other words, he's saying you've got to begin by convinced, being convinced that you're a sinner and lead that to conviction so you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior and, and you, can have, you can be converted. Did you hear that? You have to be convinced, then convicted, then confess Jesus Christ, and when you confess Jesus Christ, you become a new creature in Christ and you're converted. You're changed. All things become new. And then he finishes up with this glorious picture of, uh, of a commissioning. And we're commissioned to a new mission. That's our, the final point. Because he finishes this. He says, now all things are from God. Who reconciled us, verse 18, who reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Do you understand what this verse is saying? you understand that God is reconciling himself to the world? Do you understand that? But it's not through Muhammad. It's not through having... A, a, a sincerity of heart. You can be as sincere, as sincere as possibly being, be sincerely wrong, can't you? Uh, it, it's not sincerity that saves us. It's not uh, our good works that save us. It's not be, becoming a Baptist or a Methodist or, or switching teams. Oh, I used to be a Muslim and now I'm a Christian. I, I switch teams. No, no, it doesn't save you either. You, you can be a Christian and be as lost as a goose. You know that? Because Christ, Christianity is a religion. Jesus doesn't want you to have a religion. He wants you to be captive and captivated, overwhelmed by Jesus Christ. I, I tell you, religious people don't go, Woo! Hallelujah! Bless the Lord! Well, some do, but... Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I tell you, when you're... This is what he's talking about. You're a new creature in Christ. The old is gone, gone, the new has come. And now God is bringing you back to himself. You're reconciled. You, you have peace with God. And he has reconciled himself to you through the cross. The idea is this. Here's the bridge. You are in sin. And God is holy. And Jesus came to die on the cross for your sins. So if you, if you believe on him and call on him, you can cross cross over from death to life and have reconciliation not because of anything but what, what Jesus has done it's through him it's through Jesus Christ and he has given us what? the ministry of reconciliation you know what that means? you've been commissioned son and daughter 
And, and oh no, no, that's just for pastors. What does it say? The word pastor means serve, a ministry. I mean, you think oh, it says ministry, so it, it doesn't mean me. No, no, it doesn't mean that. It, it means you have been given the service of reconciliation. Reconciliation means you bring two parties back together. They once were enemies, now they're not. So he goes on to say, you've been given this ministry of reconciliation. And what is it? Look at verse 19. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing or not counting. You know what that word means? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a term that is used uh, when you're uh, doing accounting. And so, what he's saying is, your books are clean. He has, he has cleansed you of all your sin. You are pure in the sight of God. God's not counting your sins against you anymore. And, and, and he had to do that. Why? Because we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And if we don't have the blood of Jesus and we're standing by our own works, we have, we're not going to have a chance and so he has given us this ministry of reconciliation and we're, we're to be calling out to those lost sheep, to those who don't know Jesus Christ, to those who are the, the, the going after the one and leaving the 99, going out and seeking and saving them that are lost and letting them know, hey, God's not mad at you anymore. He loves you with an everlasting love. Yeah, you've made a mess of your life and if you continue, you, you won't have a hope. But if you turn and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can have peace with God. And He will reconcile you to Himself. He'll give you a new life, a new hope, a new attitude. Uh, uh, you, you won't be captivated by sin anymore. You'll be captivated by the love of Christ. And, and we're commissioned. We have this purpose now. Every one of us in this room has been commissioned to tell people about Jesus Christ. Now here's the scary thing. Jesus said, whoever is, afraid of, whoever is ashamed of me in this generation of him will I also be afraid. Ashamed, I mean. So he said, oh my goodness, so if I'm scared to tell my, my person that I'm working with about Jesus, I'm going to hell? Is that what it means? No, it doesn't mean that. It means you work through it. I mean, any of you married? Raise your hand if you're married. All right. All right. Uh, uh, Keith, uh, you have your ring on, buddy? All right. All right. What if you were, like, hanging out and you decided, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on Keith. You decided, you know, I really don't want people to know I'm married to Carolyn. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm really ashamed of her, so I don't... Uh, now, now, you know that would hurt a woman, wouldn't it? Do you know that's what you're doing? If you don't honor Jesus Christ in your daily life, that's what you're doing. I, I'm ashamed of you, Jesus. I don't want to honor you in front of my friends because I don't want them to think badly of me. It's not how they think about you that matters, is it? It's how they think about Jesus that matters, doesn't it? It's matter, it matters that they call upon his name and have salvation. That's what really matters. So, so this is what this is saying. We have been given this ministry of reconciliation. And I am, I am imploring you. I am challenging you. I am encouraging you not to be ashamed of Jesus but to honor him in all your life because people without Jesus are going to hell. We've been, we've been, we're new creatures in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. And God has not given us a gospel so we can just be happy about being saved. No, he gave us a gospel so that we could live for him. What is the for him about? What are we to do? Well, he's giving you a very, very specific thing about what to do. Share Jesus Christ with others. I don't know what to say. Well, there it is, right there. God's not mad at you anymore. He loves you. I mean, isn't that what this says? God's not mad at you. He loves you. And, and he, he sent his son, Jesus, so you could, he could bring you back to God. Verse 20 says very clearly what our purpose is. We are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us 
We implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God. You know what he's saying? You might be the only Bible someone ever reads. You might be the only Jesus someone ever knows. Because Jesus is inside you. And God is calling you to build a bridge of relationship with someone so that the Jesus in you can cross over into that relationship and you can make an impact in their life. You're an ambassador of God. Now, I got to ask you, how are you doing? Does God know that, that, I mean, does that, people around you know, hey, I re- represent Jesus Christ. You know, I, I've just come back from his embassy, and I have a message from the ambassador, and I am, and I am the ambassador. I have a, a, you know, from the king, and I am his ambassador, and here's the message. How are you doing? Are you doing all right? Probably not. Why have you been doing very good? Because you haven't understood your salvation. You, didn't, you weren't saved so that you could be happy and feel good about yourself. You were saved so that you could bring glory and honor to God and be good for others. You were, you were saved because you've been commissioned with this new purpose to reveal God and make him known. And by the way, that's what you're going to be doing for all eternity. So the exciting thing is we can do it now when it's hard so when we get to heaven we can say Jesus I did it then and I can do it gladly now can you imagine going to heaven and and realizing that you didn't give him glory and honor when it was hard it just you know I can't imagine how I would feel but but he we are ambassadors as if God were pleading through him we implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God he finishes with verse 21 and he made him who knew no sin This is so important. Who's him? He made him. Who is it? Who's who's the he? God. God made Jesus who knew no sin to be what? Sin. What is he talking about? Well, he's talking about why he's so seized and why he's so compelled and why this gospel message, you know, it just seized him. Oh, Lord, bless you because you sent Jesus to be my sin on Calvary's cross. Can you believe that? Oh, bless the Lord. Now, why in the world would you do that, Jesus? That you might become the righteousness of God. You know, I I mean, God has so saved us that he sees us with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I mean... You know, if Adam were, he sinned and he fell, right? And, and he, he was dead in his sins and trespasses. But you know, if God would have forgiven him and he would have sinned, he would have fallen and been in, in the same place. But God loves us so much. He gave us this eternal righteousness so that even when we sin again, he still sees us as the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I mean, it's incredible. By one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever us who are being saved. I mean, if that doesn't seize you, you've got a problem. You understand what I'm saying? You've got a problem. We've become a righteousness of God. And God wants to put us on full display. He's called us to be ambassadors. This summer was a fun summer because... I took Serenity swimming a lot. And when I took Serenity swimming, you know, she was learning a little bit, but she started to swim. She swam across the pool, real exciting. And then the moment came to dive off the diving board. (laughs) And remember when we were at your house? I think you were out there. I don't know if you were there today or not, but but, but we went to swimming at Michael and, and Debbie's. And I said uh, to, to Serenity, uh, dive like a wild woman. I want to show you this. And she got on that diving board and she took off and, and just right in the water. 
you know, it's a beautiful thing. But that's what God wants you to do. The word, the love of God, compels us, drives us, is the image of a springboard. It's that place where you get to the edge and, and, and you, you have to take that step. And, and, and there's, there's the point of no return, isn't there? Where you start bouncing on that board and then there's that point. You're going in. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. You are going in. And I don't know if you've ever swam in the love of Christ. But the love of Christ is what drives us, compels us. And he wants you to be captured and captivated and seized by that love. So that when you go off that springboard, you get lost in the glorious wonder of his grace and mercy. And you know what it means to be driven to do things you normally wouldn't do. The love of Christ is compelling you. He wants you to get on that diving board. He wants you to get to the end, and he wants you to go. Are you ready to go? And that's the only way. If you say, I love you, Jesus, and I love what you did for me, Jesus, and you're not captivated, and you're not swimming in the glories of his love, jump in. Be seized. Father, I want to thank you for this message. I ask you, Father, to pour out your spirit. I ask you, God, to do a work in us. We, we, we ask your forgiveness that we haven't fully understood the gospel. This gospel message is so that we can be good for others and bring glory to you because your love has captivated and captured us and everyone knows it. Help us to dive in, to be compelled by the love of Christ. Not our love for you, Jesus, but your love for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.